Start. Start. Hello, good good evening. November 11th, College of Complexes, show number 1,000. Excuse me. You say that there's a numbering down. Oh, yeah, but that's all right. Just start. Okay, the rules, one full at a time. No personal attacks, please. Especially at Tim. He takes it personal. The format of the College of Complexes. First, we start with announcements. Local and national and international, if you like. Second, our main speaker tonight will be Corina. Who's chime? And she'll be speaking about corporate culture and stop working so hard, people. After that, speaking, the Q&A will have the local people here Q&A, and then the Zoom people will be second, second citizens. Whatever. Good, good. Yeah, all right, all right. And then we'll have rebuttals from the, the crowd. and the Zoom people. And then the Zoom people, second place <laughs> citizens. <laughs> they can't say anything, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, they can unmute. you. And then the speaker has the last word. Karina will come up and tell us we're all done. At 7.45, we got to be out of here. Let's wrap it up. Tip well. Don't forget to take care of your... Ratsy. And what else? That's it. That's it. Let's That's start the show with the announcements. All right, Charlie, go ahead with the announcements. Unmute, Charlie. Okay, you got it. Start with the announcements, Charlie. Okay, Charlie, go. Are you there, Charlie? Seven. Seven. I can barely hear you, Charlie. Six. Seven. We're having trouble hearing you, Charlie. Can you hear me still? All right, Charlie, you're 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 open, but we can't hear you. All right, are we having any trouble with the speakers? Real quick, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Hang on, Charlie. Hang on, Charlie. Okay, you can still hear me, Charlie. Yeah. Okay, we can't hear you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the announcements on my end. We're having some trouble picking up your microphone for some reason, but try again. We're having trouble hearing it, Charlie. Sorry about that. We're having some trouble with you, Charlie. I'll start with the announcements. Okay, let's uh, proceed with the announcements. Uh, the first thing is I'd like to welcome again everybody to the college tonight. And... Uh, We'll get started on this thing. The first thing we want to do is we do have a uh, let's yeah once we get once I get to the right screen here. Sorry about all the trouble here. All right, as you can see, we start off with we do have a uh, a Google group that you can sign up for. Instructions are once you click that link, all you're going to do is send us send us a link, and we'll sign you up. We also have a meetup group that's uh, one or two announcements per week, and a Facebook page that. We also do topics for the upcoming. Yes, I am a capitalist, and yes, I do pull a. Print. I do like uh, ne ne meetings next week. Karina tonight's going to be doing stuff. Working so hard, American culture does not reward hard work. November eighteenth, uh, lessons from a cabbage patch. What I learned in Ukraine. Paul Dreyas, uh, faculty director, of University of S Sociology in the University of Dearborn, Chicago will be giving us what I learned in Lithuania in the shadow of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Next week's going to be me, is Biden the puppet of Obama, and have powerful forces have a secret path to Obama's plan for his third term. I'm going to be impacting this on uh, present-day present advisors of Obama's that are now in Biden's cabinet, and how will this impact the elections of Donald J. Trump? The following month, we're going to have uh, 
Sharon Waller, candidate for the Commissioner of Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. She's going to say climate change is real and science has become political. It's time to elect engineer scientists. Let's hope she's not another, uh, let's just hope she knows about water. What people can do for constructive change concerning the climate crisis is updated news on other problems. We'll have Andy Anderson back to, uh, to uh, take care of it. And then on the 16th, our illustrious leader, Charlie Paydock, is going to be giving a simple three-step process to terraform the Earth into a habitable planet. He's also the secretary for the Chicago Greens, and he'll uh, talk about his plan for transforming the, the world. We're going we're to be uh, on December 20th, 3rd, 23rd, and 30th. We're not going to have any holidays. Schedule will resume on January 6th, 2024. And on that date, we got two open, two openings, one for January 6th. On January 13th, the Holocaust and Genocides, Dr. Mike Ghost of the Center for Pluralism and World Muslim Congress will be speaking on this very topic. His website's the Center for Pluralism. On January 27th, disability access in the city with a focus on public transit, mediated by Kathy Powers. Now, that's the end of my announcements. Does anybody else have announcements for the for the uh, for the peanut gallery? All right, Mike, introduce Karina and let's get going. It's Karina. All right, let's give a warm rousing round of applause for Karina Schuschenheim and why we should not work so hard. All right, take it away, Karina. You don't have a PowerPoint, do you? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, an immigrant uh, shows up for his first day of work at a factory in the United States, and he believes he's going to get ahead by working hard. And he's assigned machines, and the minute work starts, he, with laser fo focus, starts pumping out the parts. He is trying to demonstrate that he is both dedicated and productive. Then the Siren goes off for the break. He needs to use the bathroom. He goes to the bathroom, washes his hands, and when he returns to his work area, what does it look like? What does he find? Another person there working. What he finds is that his work area has been trashed, and there's a note on his work area saying, stop working so hard. What are you trying to get us all fired? <laughs> the uh, office is unionized and if this uh, if this type of logic or if, if that kind of mentality is, is not um, obvious to you you are not alone there are many channels on YouTube dedicated to career advice uh, they were created by career coaches uh, experienced recruiters and and organizational psychologists um, the uh, career Betsy, uh, she has uh, various uh, videos. Want to get promoted? Be mediocre. Why incompetent people get promoted and you don't? Want to get promoted at work? Stop working so hard and do this instead. Working hard is ruining your career. Want to get promoted at work? Be lazy. Stop being too nice at work. Why your boss loves your crazy coworker and not you? Uh, are you too good at your job to get promoted? Um, there's another YouTube channel, Life After Layoff. Uh, the hidden cost of company loyalty. Your coworkers are not your friends. I learned that the hard way. How to get promoted at work. How to move up in your career. Why a set of is bad for your career. And the real reason your career is stuck. Nobody likes you. And I'm going to read for a bit of that. Uh, Dr. Grace Lee, um, who's an organizational psychologist who offers her services, um, counseling services, she's why your less experienced colleagues are promoted instead of you. Uh, four levels of value no one is talking about in your industry and how to stop being undermined at work by the higher up uh, executive president coaching. And, and these are some of, there's also like uh, leadership with Mike, why lazy coworkers get promoted and what you can help yourself. And uh, Akarsh Ramar Rai, why hardworking employees given more work but no promotion? Five mistakes to avoid. Anything about this answer? One full at a time, please. 
So, um, so, so these are the YouTube channels, but before the YouTube channels, uh, there were books. And um, the career advice books for women also did discuss uh, the, the fallacy of hard work. But this lecture is making this the singular point. The I'm making the fallacy of hard work the singular point, whereas um, many of the career books for women include this point, but that's not their singular point. Uh, and I'm soon going to be reading from a book called Games Mother Never Taught You. Uh, in the past, I've read from Powerball for Women, uh, 101 Mistakes Women Make That Accident That Sabotage Their Career. Um, I went to the library because I saw a video by Gorick Ng, and this is called The Unspoken Rules, Secrets to Starting Your Career Off Right. But there were some other books that were around that, sh uh, that were nearby. Um, one of them, Get Out of Your Own Way at Work and Help Others Do the Same by Mark Goldstein. Um, Stop Pushing Me Around. Um, a uh, workplace guide for the timid, shy, and less assertive. A survival guide for working with bad bosses. Dealing with bullies, idiots, backstabbers, and other managers from hell. <laughs> uh, when smart people work for dumb bosses, how to survive a crazy dysfunctional workplace. <laughs> Working with you is killing me. Uh, free yourself from emotional traps at work. There's another one called how to work for a jerk. Uh, mean girls at work, how to stay professional when things get personal. And uh, I just mentioned the unwritten rule. Actually, there's a lot of um, uh, books about with career advice, but I have to read a very uh, a, a important, what I feel is a very important section of a book from Games Mother Never Taught You. This was written, originally published in 1977 by Warner Books. It was written by Betty Lehan Harrigan. And um, it, it, uh, there also was a, a made for TV uh, movie starring Loretta Swift. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is probably the most important part of my speech. It says here, I've always considered myself lucky because the first full-time job I ever had was a high precision grinder on an assembly line in an airport parts factory. For almost three years, I was paid on piecework basis. All finished products were checked by inspectors who credited perfect ones, returned defective ones for repair, and scraped those totally damaged. In such a job, performance is objectively measured and salary is direct compensation for the quality and volume of work produced. The monetary rewards were tied to hard work and perfectionism and efficiency. Right? Absolutely wrong. Here's why. I love the machinery and the metal. The polished steel sculptures flew off my machine so rapidly that operators in the line behind me couldn't feed through the rough pieces fast enough. I'd help others at their job to process the work through to me because I was making fabulous money for those days. Uh, this financial bubble burst in a few weeks when the efficiency engineers descended like vultures to recalculate the piece work rates on my operation. Management's response was quick. If I could produce so well and so efficiently, then the job was obviously overpriced and I should get paid less per piece. My indoctrination in the Protestant work ethic was demolished instantly. In the real world, if you work too hard and perform above average, your work and ability are devalued, not appreciated and rewarded. What really happened was that I didn't know the rules of the game. She didn't know the rules of the game. There's rules. But the rules are unspoken rules. And politics means um, unspoken, unwritten rules. They're, they're rules you're supposed to pick up uh, without being told explicitly. You're supposed to imply them. Uh, so uh, she said, which, by the way, is not exclusive to white collar office workers. I was a dumb kid who thought you should work as hard as you can for your money and do the best job possible for the company. And you will be suitably rewarded. In this particular game, the management rate setters understood that experienced men, men machinists deliberately slowed down their work pace when 
efficiency engineers were observing because the longer it took to finish a piece, the higher the rate. Naturally, rate setters had adopted a formula to compensate for the delaying tactics, tactics say 20%. Not knowing the slow down game, I operated my machine at peak performance speed. To show how good I was, but the Rangers automatically calculated that output at a maximum of 80% of my real capacity. That's how they lowered my per rate piece. And now I had to turn out 20% more pieces than I was able to produce at peak performance. So my earnings dropped a whopping 20% for top work. After that, I made it my business to figure out the salary compensation game. When I played it expertly, I got my working time down to two hours out of eight. The other six hours, I goofed off. I collected hefty bonuses and overtime when they needed my excess production and were willing to pay heavily for it. Performance is not so easily measured in the professional or white collar jobs, but the by play on pay is equally merciless. Women who demonstrate exceptional abilities are gradually overloaded with additional work demands without added compensation. It is assumed that if they could do so much extra, the job tasks were overpriced. And so this, this is the important piece that I am, um, this is, uh, uh, this, if, if you don't listen to anything else, please uh, listen to the ex pay attention, or I hope you pay attention to this uh, expert. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, there was a woman who had a, a woman had a job, you know, and then uh, she either got fired or quit or maybe they left by mutual um, agreement. And then she gets up and she brags and she says, yeah, they got rid of me and it took two or three workers to replace me. Now, she shouldn't be gloating. She should be hanging her head in shame. This is shameful because she was giving the company too good a deal. She shouldn't have been doing that much work uh, for the company. Um, in corporate culture, the, the one uh, Dr. Grace Lee in her YouTube channel, she 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 talks and she has a large global uh, overview of corporate culture, and she talks about the four level of values. And the first level is implementation. And so the lower rungs of our society, these trash people, we know them because we call them essential. Right, so uh, during the lockdown, they were the essential people who we couldn't do without, and we needed them to show up to work. Um, and uh, if you're in implementation, you are the doer. You have the technical knowledge of expertise. You get things done. And the market values implementation the least. Now, if you are, um, let's say, a welder, or okay, so you're one of the doers, and you are the very best one. You're the best accountant. You're the best welder, uh, you are the most knowledgeable uh, software computer programmer, you're still in implementation. You're still at the lowest rung of uh, the, the ladder. If you are the very best at what you do, or if you're the one who is the only one who can do your job, or if you're really, really expert, forget about it. You're irreplaceable. There's no way I'm going to promote you. I'm not going to promote you. You have to stay where you are. I can't, you're, you're irreplaceable. You've just locked yourself in that position. Um, and then the second uh, layer is uh, unification. That's somebody who manages people, processes, and projects, and these are managers. Uh, she notices, uh, Dr. Joyce Lee notices that there tends to be a trap that people go, oh, I need more education, and they get these MBAs and certifications and degrees. Um, at one time, there was a PMP certification, and uh, then they think maybe I need to work harder to prove myself, but these are traps. And then the third um, of, of layer that the society values, the marketplace values is communication, being a great communicator, being able to talk well. And this is where you begin to get uh, the overall company fiscal responsibilities. And then uh, finally, uh, something very glorious and very beautiful is imagination. Um, so I'm going to, I could talk about this for an hour, but I will give you some examples, uh, one of which is Apple. So Apple was founded by Steve Jobs and who else? Who else founded Apple? Yeah, okay. So you do know who Steve Wozniak is. 
but Steve Jobs is dreamy. Steve Jobs is a visionary. Steve Jobs um, was the one who had the ideas while Steve uh, Wozniak was bent over doing the real heavy lifting. He did some extremely hard, no Steve Wozniak, no Apple. Um, but there's just a, a love for Steve Jobs. Uh, similarly, I would also argue Bill Gates and Paul Allen. And Paul Allen had to kind of write a book explaining, hey, I was part of this too, because we all worship Bill Gates. Um, and, and Paul Allen is, is kind of a, a, a extra in the, in the formula, though he did the critical work to create Apple along with others. Um, I have a, a clip on YouTube, Bill Burr, uh, he's, he's on the show with Conan O'Brien, and um, the clip on YouTube, he says, Steve, Bill Burr doesn't believe the Steve Jobs hype. Um, and I have this, um, I have a link over here. Um, I can share my notes with anyone who wants it, but uh, Bill Burr goes on and he says, did he like sit down and like, I'm going to invent the iPhone and just sat there soldiering, possibly rolling right? Didn't he have like a crew of guys helping him out? Sure, maybe he did. Well, why when he goes to those nerd fest, didn't he have like a chorus of scientists behind him who helped him out too? He walked like he was Tesla, like tapping into electricity. I think he just kind of like told people what to invent. He just kind of like came in and like, I want my whole music collection on my phone. I got on it. And Nameless, faceless guy, yeah, uh, made it happen. And, and then they have the big nerd concert, and he goes out there by himself. No belts, no sneakers on. I, I just didn't buy it. And uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite Bill Burke clips uh, that I have. Um, is there anyone um, who works harder uh, than farmers? I, I actually just recently finished the novel, and there's a character. Uh, there were two families. One of them was the Hamiltons, and Samuel Hamilton uh, was a very inventive and creative. Well, he 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 did the invention, and he went to people's. He had bad land, but he went into people's houses and fit, fixed, built windmills, built fixer fixer machines, uh, fixed, and, and did a lot and, and made their equipment work. And Sam Hamilton grows up in, in relative poverty, uh, not dire or abject poverty, but his family's poor, they're never rich. Um, and, um, and, and Samuel Hamilton then uh, becomes an adult who becomes very, very rich and knows how to make a buck. Um, at one point, this is at the t beginning of World War I, and he knows that the war is gonna happen. And um, so somebody from another family, Caleb, uh, Caleb Trask says, well, we could grow beans. Yeah, that's it, we'll grow beans. There's no money in that, said Will. Farmers don't make any money. It's the man who buys from him and sells. You'll never make any money farming. Um, and, um, and so uh, uh, there's three R's uh, that, uh, Life after layoff, he says, there's three R's. Uh, results that matter to talk executive. So impact is like a tree falling into the woods. If nobody is around to notice it, it still happens, but nobody cares. So when you're doing work at work, make sure that it is, don't ever ghost. Don't ever um, do things silently or don't. Uh, I had a friend once who would sneak into the, he worked at a grocery chain and was the administrator and he would act, he would sneak in and do extra work on the side. Don't go, don't, don't do that. Make sure that it's official and sanctioned by your manager or is an official project. If, if it isn't a project, ask, well, this is going to be a project and, and this is a visible project. Um, don't overachieve on everything. When you give your top effort to everything, it can signalize that you don't know how to prioritize. Um, so, um, and uh, the, the other thing is, um, the other R is the relationship with the executive, and that's where the Chad complex comes in. Uh, executives who are also Chads want to be like him. Okay, so, uh, and then the other is your reputation. That some people call your unique awesomeness quotient. So actually, I was actually reading from Jennifer Brick, the career faculty, but um, in the book, uh, Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling, um, which is written or geared towards Asian employees, um, the 
the author talks about homosocial reproduction, that we tend to hang out with people like us and managers likewise tend to hire or promote people like them. And I was at PCC Information Services and I remember my manager was middle-aged and there was a new guy and the new guy smoked cigarettes and my manager just had an affinity with him because it, it was carefree. It was throwing the rules out the windows and it, it was a way of coming and, and so my manager would bum some cigarettes off him and it, it, they created this affinity or a uh, relationship. Um, I will read now from uh, the, the life after layoff, but, but uh, people who get promoted are people who either remind the executives of themselves or are what the executives want to be. Um, the, the, the executives, 50 years old, I'm 51, and, and this young guy's really athletic and, you know, has good looks and stamina. Uh, life after layoff. Um, so there's a fallacy out there that the best way to get ahead in your career is by being the best at your job. We're all ingrained with this idea that if we work hard and we pay our dues, and that one day we'll get noticed in a big promotion what ends up happening as too many people go through their career doing what they think they're supposed to be doing and it only ends up with frustration. The cold hard fact in corporate America is that the most talented, skilled, or even hardworking people are not getting promoted. You may find yourself uh, in this situation um, too many times. Have you noticed a senior leader who lacks common sense, basic skills, and seems to bumble their way up the corporate ladder you're left scathing ahead about how they got into such a position of power with such incompetence. And it always seems that the person who's getting promoted is often nowhere near the top of the heap when it comes to technical qualification. But the one probably the most critical advantage is that, but, I don't really know what said. Um, but the one and probably most critical advantage that they have over you is that they are more visible. So you have to make yourself visible and work on the visible projects. And um, if your uh, CEO forms these committees, nowadays it's the diversity committee um, or, you know, um, let's form a committee to create a purpose statement or whatever. You have to be on those committees. Um, even if you don't want to, because it, it, it introduces you to the executives and um, he men of the corporate world. Uh, in other words, they're liked by decision makers. You're probably not. And being likable in the workplace context isn't just a personality trait. They're not often the friendliest person in the organization, but they have the uncanny ability to always be in the right place at the right time and therefore having their names being brought up frequently with those in power. So what you actually have is a visibility problem, simply put. Um, nobody that matters likes you. Now before you, okay, so he, this, um, this I have a link to, that. that is his, um, that, that's his uh, video, um, the real reason your career respect nobody likes you, but he, he goes on and it's, um, so as, as I was saying, the, the three R's are results that matter to the top executives, uh, relationships with executives and reputation, your unique awesomeness quotient. And the relationship with executives, uh, that, that's where we end up with somebody who I have been describing and who a life after layoff was describing and that's Slacker Chad and Slacker Chad uh, just uh, has all the soft skills and maybe not all the hard skills, but he has the soft skills and he always manages to fail upwards. Um, so maybe he isn't the best computer programmer, but, and I like to be in, with, in meetings with him and he reminds me of myself or he's somebody I want to be like. Um, uh, the non-technical skills to master communication, you have to persuade, present, position, uh, self-mastery, heightened sense of self-awareness of how other people perceive you and your blind spots. It's nice to work in a place with the 365 reviews where people review each other anonymously and take surveys. Um, 
you often, if I just walk up to you and ask, what do you think of me? You're, well, Karina, you're nice. I, I like you. No, but honestly, tell me what my thought. Oh, I don't think you have any flaws. I think you're a nice person. It's, it's not everybody can go out and give constructive criticism. So that's why I like the blind 365 survey. Um, uh, Self-mastery, you need to be aware of who you are and how you're perceived, your ability to influence others and yourself, your ability to manage your emotions, uh, to make more rational decisions, and your decision-making skills. Uh, contextualized within a broader context of the marketplace and critical thinking. Um, I was at US Foods. Um, I am a application developer and I actually thought, or I, I really knew that the real work is done by the buyers, demand planners and cost analysts. And I created uh, excellent reports exactly as I wanted for these people. The, the young men who came in and went ahead of me, these were people who made uh, instead of um, Excel workbooks or just tab worksheet, tabular worksheets, they created the, the um, graphical visualization. We use a tool called Tableau and these were seen by the executives and they're the ones who got promoted. And I did it. I had more reports. Um, I did more work uh, and my work was, the, 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 their work was seen by the executives and they made it up and I, had kind of when I got laid off after surviving and not being furloughed, there was a succession of furloughs. I was never furloughed, but I in the end was laid off along with a lot of the other middle aged people. Most of the people in the year 2000, August 2000, were, were um, middle aged who, who got the layoff. But when I kind of had this evil um, dream of oh, who's going to support Karina's stuff? Oh, I didn't know Karina did all this work. Oh, I, uh, oh, I didn't, oh no, she, I wasn't aware that she did this and this. Um, there's, um, loyalty is bad, loyalty to a company is bad uh, by waiting for somebody else to recognize you or paying your dues and hope somebody will reward your loyalty. Or you're simply letting others manage your career. Not only that, but you'll be passed up in compensation. Um, in fact, it's kind of raises an eyebrow if you do, if you are on the job looking for a job and you've been at your current workplace for 10 years, really over five years, okay, do you have current skills or do you only know how to do things your old company's way? Um, five mistakes to avoid. My work will speak for itself. Uh, being afraid of speed feedback, internally focused, uh, missing the bigger picture. Um, and then uh, in breaking the bamboo ceiling on page 236, she says, putting your head down for too long may only keep you in your seat, not move you up in the corporate ladder. Because I personally am very comfortable being a nose down, uh, do the work programmer, but I've suffered greatly for that. Not speaking up front, maintaining a distance from management and um, restricting restricted networks. Um, so even in the book, uh, Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling on your first day, you need a plan to meet all your coworkers and managers, introduce yourself and start forming networks. Um, according to uh, career advice, you should be looking for your next job the first day you start your current job. Um, uh, criteria used by hiring managers, good technical skills, strong per interpersonal abilities and a good long-term potential fit for the firm. Two of those things had nothing to do with your work. It was good technical skills, strong interpersonal abilities and good long-term potential for the firm. And um, uh, there's a, a excerpt from uh, Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling. Uh, um, in a recruiting committee, I once facilitated a group of six business managers who were arguing about David Takaka a Japanese American candidate they had interviewed. They were divided about whether to extend him a job offer. Three of them felt strongly about David and wanted to hire him right away. The other three had great experience, but would thought he had great experience, but wouldn't it be a good fit for the group. When I pressed further, one of them said that David didn't come across as somebody who would enjoy hanging out with them after hours. He seemed very formal and polite during the interview. Uh, yet they had no proof that he was antisocial. I sensed the problem was merely personality and style differences at play. 
no one in the room can identify a concrete statement he had made that alluded to a lack of interest in, the, in connecting with the group socially. One of the three naysayers pulled me aside uh, after the meeting. You know what? He may be a great addition to our group. Fact is, he just really came across formally, and we didn't feel comfortable with that. I asked, why don't we bring him in again to meet us over a recruiting lunch? I will let him know that we are still interested and we want to get to know him better. I remember his mentioning to me during an informal conversation that he came to the United States at the age of 10 and was raised in a pretty traditional house, which tends to be more structured, more formal with people in positions of authority. If going out for drinks was the only factor holding my clients back from hiring him, might not he, he add some diversity to the team and contribute a new perspective? The five men who grew up in the, um, and contribute, <clears throat> might he not add some diversity to the team and contribute new perspectives that five men um, who grew up in the business by following their father's footsteps may not have. My suggestion was a risky move because these men were internal clients and I was in an HR director. So then she has another, um, after the recruiting lunch, um, I continued to hold my ground. Um, she's right, Dave seems like he could be molded. His product knowledge and ability bring in, to bring in clients is the most important thing to the group right now. He was fine at lunch and obviously has been successful in his own right. We need to make sure that we don't pass up a great candidate because we feel like we wouldn't want to go drinking. He wouldn't want to go drinking with the rest of us. Except that that's a happy ending, but you don't always have that happy ending. And um, this has been shown 2020 had um, years, decades ago where um, they would have two candidates show up for a job and one was gorgeous and one was not gorgeous. And they, they, they had, you know, how the two were received and they were received uh, very differently. Um, so if you're gonna work, work on a very high visible project. If it isn't a highly visible product, don't bust your ass doing it. Um, Always leave the office if you're still working at an office. I work 100% remote, but never be in the office late on a Friday night. Um, try to form relationships with um, your colleagues. And if you don't like your colleagues, then pretend that you're an actor, okay? Get ready for the, your Academy Award. You're, you're pretending to be your own. You're pretending to be your uh, personal life with your private life, which you do it. Your private life is your business, but pretend that you like them or whatever. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, in the book, um, in, in, there's a rap video, it's Fight the Power um, by Public Enemy. Uh, he goes, uh, people, people, we are the same. No, we're not the same because we don't know the game. And so when you start your job, you need to observe and figure out and learn how your corporate culture and your company ticks. And that's easier for some than it is for others. Um, there's two Bible verses that I have here. Um, Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. 38 to 42. Jesus said to his disciples, and Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said but martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made she came to him and asked lord don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself tell her to help me martha martha the lord answered you are worried and accept about many things but few of them are needed or only one indeed only one mary has chosen what is better um, the second is Matthew uh, chapter 21, verse Matthew uh, chapter 21, Matthew uh, chapter 21, Matthew uh, chapter 21, Matthew uh, chapter 21, Matthew. Uh, we, we have a trouble with one of the guys. He keeps on muting. I just sent him a message. Uh, Michael, um, we're just all muting right now during the Zoom, uh, during uh, Karina's part of the presentation. 
because uh, you're getting some excessive background noise when you when you open up your mic. That's all. So there's nothing wrong with your system. It's just I've muted you a few times. So please continue, Karina. Please continue. Please continue. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew, well, we chapter 21, verse 28 to 31, the parable of two sons. Uh, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons, and he went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. Later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the father want? Did what the father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. Even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. And that's what I got. Okay, so you're done. All right. All right, Karina, you ready to take questions? I am ready to take questions. Okay. Um, the first one is, how often do you follow this advice yourself? Uh, I have had a miserable career, and I haven't followed my advice. And I, uh, I remind myself of this advice. I do get off on a Friday. When it is Friday, it's 3 o'clock. I, I log out. Um, I do try to go for, I, I don't overwork. I did stop overworking and um, I have a CIO who shows up at my scrums. I have daily scrums with my team and I make sure that I tell that chief information officer that I am in line <clears throat> with his, with, with the company's corporate objectives and, and, um, and I do present but I'm not currently part of the diversity committee or the rules committee or communication um, that the executives have. So, um, but yeah, um, I am, I have been on some highly visible pro projects. So in my current job. Do you feel that you've like learned something now on it? We'll go to Charlie next after this. Uh, yes, but for me, it's definitely a work in progress. I don't hesitate to say that. Yeah. Okay. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Unmute and ask a question. All right, Karina, can you hear me? I yes. can hear you. Uh, in the government, the awarding of promotions is a real complex process called merit staffing. Two-part question. I was wondering where you were employed. What exactly was the procedures for awarding promotions and were they appealable if somebody was looked over? Was there an appeal process? There's no appeal process. Is that for personally? The appeal process is that you may ask to talk with your manager, meet in a private room and go, why did you pick him instead of me? Don't you know that I do all the work? Or um, there, there is no formal appeal process for not getting a promotion. Um, Promotions, well, I know that when I was laid off, that wasn't my manager's decision, that was a director's decision. Um, the the people who decide and, and um, but uh, but uh, how, how people get hired, uh, it's, it's manager and HR. And the thing about tech is that often the people in HR don't know anything about tech and then they'll even be asking you basic questions um, when you're coming in and what they write in the job description has nothing to do with the actual job, but whatever. Um, but getting hired, who makes the hiring is partly HR, partly the manager and director and um, uh, maybe even the VP. Um, the, um, and who gets a promotion? I'm really not, the, the thing is I'm not in on those meetings. But there is a question, are you going to get promoted? And if you're asked to go to corporate recruiting events, if you're asked to be on panels where you decide task force, you know, do we wanna, which software do we wanna purchase to do this job? Uh, then you're on your way up. If you're not considered to do any of the college recruiting or any of the, to be in any of the um, 
um, interviews, candidate interviews, and not ask any uh, serious um, decision making questions, and you're not on your way up. Okay, who's next? Come on, this is not something. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. All right, make sure. Loud. They were wanting to pass up. He almost did so that it's Japanese, and that's very, you would think that would be, but the nerve culture, many of them have it. You go socialize that to work. That's part of the Japanese work over there. But it is, is um, in, in, so uh, the, the book is called Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling. And what's happened in the United States is, is that there are Asian immigrants who've done well, they've done very well, but they've, a lot of times now, uh, they've done well as engineers, doctors, lawyers, but they aren't filling by and large, by and large, they're not filling their C-suite, they're not executives they're not on the board of directors they're not corporate uh head honchos and in this tends to and i'm being racist as the population tend to be a very well educated uh, population and they're just not becoming top executives that's why this woman wrote the book breaking the bamboo ceiling um now when uh, originally when when at the beginning of my Microsoft in the beginning of Apple, they were very, very confrontational and people had screaming matches uh, in front of other employees and they were rude. In the Asian culture, uh, you, it is, which is partly Confucian, uh, you respect your elders and you don't challenge your elders and you especially don't challenge your elders in front of other people. Now, in America, that may be, if you correct, in, you may that that may not be looked down on as much as it is in the Asian culture, but um, an Asian showing up for a job interview could be formal or, or stiff. It, it wasn't whether he would hang out with them at work or not. It's his behavior during the job interview is that he was formal and serious and wasn't. How about them cubs? You know, or um, uh, and and. Um, that people like other people with senses of humor and not people who err on the serious side. What I believe is that if we hire, if more and more Asians come to the United States and if they do uh, take control over more of the C-suites, I believe that they have the ability to change corporate America and to make it more of a meritocracy and to make it less about networking. They won't do things flawless, but I believe that they could, they could shift corporate America, if you had more Asians. Uh, now, the CEO of PepsiCo is from India. She's a female. Um, and um, currently, the CEO of uh, Microsoft, is he not also from India? Yeah, he is. Yeah, so, you know, but I, I believe that they can shift and change things and make things a more meritocratic. And I don't think you can just look at Asians. Repeat the question, please. Each culture is different, I believe, is what he's saying. We didn't but, hear the uh, question. A corporate professional in HR who who saw a trend, and so she wrote the book, Breaking the Bamboo Ceiling, which is at the Chicago Public Library. I, I do recommend it. Um, they had a self-evaluation segment that was very hard for me to get through, but I did. But... <clears throat> Okay, who's next? Who's next? Okay. Uh, no more questions. We got some more questions, I'm sure. Okay, uh, yeah. Can you, uh, all right. Go ahead and hear you. I'm sick they can hear you. Okay. I have been preoccupied and I have to take the job question, home. Marina, what about taking the job home and have you done it? I have and I regret it. I don't recommend taking the job home. I recommend a, a, a change, um, a, a sharp division, a sharp boundary between your professional life and your personal life. Um, 
I, I do work 100% remote, but I'm in a company that's 100% remote. My CEO isn't in Illinois, nor is my CIO. Um, and um, I have with my company brags, my current company brags about having 44 states, employees in 44 different states. So we are 100% remote um, without any um, persuasion from the employees. My company is 100% remote. And that's different. And that probably brings its own rules as well. Um, but um, I am able to turn the computer off and off is off and I'll get to this tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Charlie, you got another question. Go ahead. Yes, Karina. Under basic labor law and clauses of most union contracts, management or the owner retains the right to hire and promote. Among, this is a key, among qualified candidates for the position. In your experience, has anybody been promoted who was not qualified for the position? Yes. Was that frequent? Um. The people who were promoted played the game. Um, for one thing, I work, um, I am a, a software developer and one of the men who went up, he didn't even know what a database view was. Um, we had to teach him what a database view was. So I was busy creating reports for uh, the low level buyers, demand planners and cost analysts. And he was creating a, a Visio Tableau for the, um, executives and and um he was just somebody who honestly shit golding in ingots and just rose water um it just was, uh and uh, he he definitely made a bigger impression made the better networks and went way ahead of me um the i think that there is a question here do women sleep their way to the top and i haven't seen any of that i have not seen um a woman who sleeps so but i'm in the technical i'm in i'm in the technical area so um i'm not sure if we're all sleepable you know as, as much as maybe the, it was the 80s you had your high heels your nylons your skirts the knees you know it's today now and all right, Mike, loud Mike, please. No, I have had my own. Louder, Mike. I've had my own consulting business for like 15 years, so I'm like my own boss and my customer. Uh, one of my product lines and business is around the and which is Things like that. It, it, nowadays, in do companies, how much surveillance is going on of employees? Is there CCTV? Is there ways to monitor? My company is Microsoft. My company is a Microsoft company. We have Microsoft Teams running. Um, I'm sure I'm being surveyed. Uh, one of the things that my the security group does is it sends malicious. My security team sends. What would be malicious phishing emails out to us if we'll do it? Yeah, click on it. Or if we know better and we'll mark it as a phishing email. Phishing is C H I S H I N G. It's malicious um, software. Well, I'm on Microsoft Teams. On my team or my company's on the full Microsoft suite. So um, first, when I log in, to log in on to now I, I I have a very separate I have my own PC which I own and I can do what I want on but they're they're mis they're when I'm logging on to my work computer which is owned by the company and is their computer um, I, I'm sure they if they can't just as, I would uh, I would assume that they could um, the first thing I do is I use a 2FA code and get into their security system without which, yeah, so. But if if, 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 if I don't think they could, I would just assume that, that they're able to. So I don't know, but I'm. Are 
Yeah. We're fully, we're Microsoft through and through. My company is Microsoft. We all work remotely. So you can put as many surveillance cameras in the office, but we all work remotely. Uh, there was a change when I was at US Foods and they were, you used to have your own cubicle and they were getting rid of cubicles and doing this just in time system where you didn't have your own cubicle, but you had your own, you, you had to come in and set your workspace and kind of rent it every day. And that led to less privacy. Luckily I missed that, but yeah. yeah. Mr. Barden. Right, Jonathan, real loud, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, oh, the number one priority of 21st century workers is uh, to make as much money as possible, be able to retire as soon as possible, and then forget about most or all of our former co workers' quality of life uh, value and to do comfortable with the door for managerial. Unfortunately, that's the number one priority, it seems to me. In your analysis, how can we as a society shift to a new outlook where the goals are to make uh, our communities where not some few lucky workers are employed and lots of workers are struggling to be unemployed? and support each other coexist in a culture of rejecting materialism, rejecting class. In essence, embracing democracy. For me, the best of democracy. Uh, it's going to be very hard to get Americans to reject materialism. Um, we're very, we're still very married to petroleum. I do believe that we need unions. I believe that we need unions to bring uh, the executive level down and bring the regular, you know, those people, essential workers up. And so that's why I have been uh, excitedly following uh, the break at the three auto companies. And I think that their new union leader is effective and understands strategy better than I do. Um, and so I, I think we need unions, but I can't address your issue, but I could address the issue about how to alleviate the gap between the executive and the lower guy's pay. Um, yeah, um, you, you probably, if you are working, want to have multiple income streams. Uh, and, um, and, and so um, either learn about the equity market or the stock market or learn how to be a landlord to then be able to retire early. We certainly don't retire now from having one job and working there for three. Nobody does that except for state workers or public servants. But uh, but but, but <laughs> most people don't. That the, the days even before I started working, the days of I'm going to work here and then retire at 55 with a gold watch or pension or whatever. You know, now that we've switched from pensions to 401ks. Um, you know, I, I would use a 401k and get to match as much as possible, but, and, and, and science has proved that most people are better off just investing in the S&P 500, either through Sky Spider or Vanguard S&P 500, um, the stock, ticker name is VOO versus trying to pick stocks and make money. Um, just as a quick follow-up observation, uh, especially in campaign season, to me, it seems like what the diet is more healthier for all of us is if we started talking about an economy where we didn't necessarily, per se, eliminate job status and the degree of quality of life, but just start to shift the dialogue in a radically new direction of general basic income, universal basic income, where people will then be motivated to work anyway because they're not going to die as a result of the rat race and the race to the bottom. That's an observation. That's not really a question. Okay. Okay. Charlie, go ahead. Go ahead, Charlie. All right. Uh, in the United States, any woman who 
applies for a promotion and is passed over can appeal to the EEO Commission, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and file a charge. And if she succeeds, she will win the promotion and even the employer can be penalized for upwards of something like over $100,000. Um, are you aware of anyone who has pursued that? Uh, I have well, like cheated. sexual harassment lawsuits. Um, and, uh, no, it's not harassment. But, um, this is promotion. Because you didn't give me that promotion. Uh, I Every year I go through training on sexual harassment and hostile work environment, and that also covers other types of harassment as well including discrimination based on age-based discrimination. Uh, you didn't give me that promotion and I'm gonna sue you because you, I haven't seen that and that that's, could be hard to prove and you can always come up with some shit. Um, or, or I can fire you at will, I can fire you for any reason. You know, you should get fired for any reason. Um, you came in here with bad breath, you're fired, you know I mean? You, you have very little protection of a job if you're not inside a union or working for the government. Um, um, nobody's owed a promote owed a promotion. So, but an EEO complaint is a protected activity. You cannot be fired for filing one. I haven't met anyone who's fired an EEO complaint. I have met laid off workers who, if you're laid off and everybody else is laid off under who are, um, and you think it was age-based discrimination. I have met people who filed lawsuits because they thought they were discriminated, they were picked to be laid off because of their age. Yes, Doug. Yeah, <clears throat> Marina, I see you know a lot about uh, computers. Uh, do you think that uh, with this new AI that's supposed to be so great, uh, if AI were doing the interviews of uh, job seekers, that they would do a better job, um, as you suggest? Uh, the answer is no. Um, we have LinkedIn and LinkedIn is kind of an AI tool and it's been demonstrated that LinkedIn discriminates against who else? Middle-aged women. Uh, they, you have two, you know, and that's, and, and the way we do this is, is, is you have the two identical resumes, but one, one is a man, one is a woman and the woman doesn't get picked and the man does. Women get old, men get distinguished and experienced. Um, okay, who is next? I got a question. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Aloud, please. So there's like an education gap apparently going on where more women are getting educated. And, uh, do you think that when you get to the point where more women are in level positions or in management like some of this culture might change at all or the truth is 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 that women tend to be taking charge of college you know we there's more women getting college degrees more women um in with higher education degrees but do the degrees actually teach you what you know for corporate culture in a corporate environment. Um, a lot of the skills I'm talking are about, and maybe these are innate skills, the ability to read people, uh, the ability to listen to the grapevine, know what's going on, ability to politics. Uh, and I don't think a 12 PhDs is gonna help you do that. Um, I would argue with physics and electronics or even accounting. Yeah, you probably do need a college degree, but uh, I'm hoping for an, uh, a shift towards apprenticeships. Um, I know with software programming, people are going much more towards boot camps and working on actual products. Uh, you don't read about, um, I, I think we're, we're moving away from higher education. Um, some people are actors and they went to famous drama schools and some people just drove into Los Angeles and became extremely famous actors. So um, the, I want you to ask, what is it that they have to teach you? Now, I, I and some things too, if I wanted to be an x-ray technician, I'm sure I do need training to do that. I do, okay. This is the 
machinery. This is how you do it. But the most important training will be on the job training and actually being done at work. And I, I, I think we're going to have to shift more towards apprenticeship. You don't need a, a bachelor's degree to do my job. And I am. And with programming more and more is becoming codeless programming or more about how to configure the actual than, than actually writing out the syntax, writing out the code. Um, so. okay. who, else, who else has a question? Um, I have a question. All right, Dan. Ahead. Okay. Um, you can show yourself, Dan. It'd be nice. All right. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Um, you work for Microsoft. Microsoft has. Um, I work for Microsoft. I work for Allied Benefit Systems, but we well, are a Microsoft shop. We use the Microsoft. We use Microsoft Teams. Okay. Microsoft Office. Uh, okay. Microsoft DevOps. Uh, which is part of the Azure environment. So okay. we subscribe to Microsoft, but we are not Microsoft. Okay. So it's a big company, 44 states. That's pretty big. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Microsoft or Apple or Google had a contract with Israel, not Pegasus, something else. And there were some uh, people protesting against the contract. Are there any whistleblowers that you know of? Are you going to blow the whistle on Microsoft on this company? No, I mean, what I mean is, <clears throat> is there any? Have you heard of anything about that contract? I guess you should no. talk about it. Uh, no, I haven't heard about that. No. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so, do you have a master's degree? I don't have a master's. I have a bachelor's. In programming? Math. Okay. From where? Uh, Indiana University, but honey, that was a long time ago. I'm 51 years old. So. Okay. You're young. Uh, yeah. 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 Hey, spring here. chicken. I'm 62, and I'm still the spring chicken. <laughs> All right. Um, Who's the, next? the the other the the corporate the books on corporate advice for women often honestly in, uh, including a thousand and one mistakes women hundred and one mistakes women make that sabotage their careers the corporate advice is not to be the whistleblower because the whistleblowers often don't if you're in a really shady shitty situation your best bet is to leave the company and you left it because you don't like the community. Um, th that's really the better trying to the whistleblower or, or being the voice of conscience will often not in all reality. And I know it makes a good movie, but it doesn't usually don't <laughs> have good ending for you. I mean, right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next question, please. Yeah. All right. Let me get John camera and shout. <laughs> Okay, who's that? Uh, Ernie. Okay, Ernie, go ahead. Loud, Ernie. Yeah, yeah. Um, questions here. Um, louder, Ernie. Your, oh, louder? Yeah. Right. In Europe, uh, and they, they put people off somewhere around the seventh or eighth grade. And people are going to higher engine uh, education for engineering or teaching or whatever. How do you feel about that? And my second question is, uh, isn't there some value to society as a whole having people educated and uh, liberal education, even if they aren't getting they learn yeah. in their job? How do you feel about yeah. that? Uh, there's two very separate questions. One is about the baccalaureate system in Europe. Um, if you were to do a scientific analysis and says and ask, you know, which system produces better results, seems like the baccalaureate does. Uh, maybe we need to study Finland, which has an outstanding educational system. But, but, but the goddamn thing is, is that Finland and Japan and South Korea and India with their brilliant education systems don't invent the internet, don't uh, create Google, don't, and, and that's the head scratcher. They're not creating um, Netflix. They're not creating um, uh, uh, 
Tesla, and and so they they yes, we should up the education of the average uh, person, but for some odd reason, they're just they're not creating. Um, you know, yeah, okay, so you have Nokia and, and you have other, you know, um, uh, Mercado Libre and, and, you know, other companies, but why is it that we're the ones creating, you know, some of the bigger uh, masses, uh, in addition to the shit that we create too, like WeWork and um, Theranos and, um, and um, you know, some of the garbage that we create, we also do create some of the more brilliant uh, companies um, and and so that that's the head scratcher why we are less educated and the average man is worse off but yet somehow um, we're where it's at you know um, uh, you you don't you know Elon Musk is from South Africa he didn't go to South Africa he built companies in the United States because that's where it's at now you've had another question here too um, I think education is great and I think education is important and I think it's wonderful that you can now access uh, classes online, classes from Harvard. I took a class at Yale, Introduction to Roman Architecture. Then I went to Rome and I looked at the Roman, Arch Roman Architecture, which was very delightful. And I think that's wonderful. Um, I would love to speak Portuguese or Japanese and I think that that has value. The question that my, my clarifying point is it's not skills that would be used at work necessarily. Um, so I'm not, uh, and also is the best way to be taught through a classroom in a lecture hall or how, you know, the, the pedagogy, how, how do you learn? Um, okay, um, anybody other questions? Anybody? Yeah. Have? Okay, go ahead, Charlie. And then we'll get the next one back here. Uh, did you ever, I don't know this, but at your employer, if you wanted to take coursework and develop your skills, how did the employer, were they willing to pay uh, for training expenses if you wanted to pursue further schooling? We are in a global now and you can get brilliant training online relatively cheaply. Um, when I we were switching over to Power Apps, and I took a course at Udacity, my employer didn't compensate me. It cost me twenty bucks. Uh, boo hoo, twenty dollars. Um, the offerings right now: Udemy, Udacity, LinkedIn Learn, and corporations also will probably will, will offer these, um, like uh, Lynda.com, where I was in my prior job. They had a free. Um, Class, you, you had a free sub, subscription to lynda.com. Uh, in terms of MBA, some people, some employers will pay for their certain people to get an MBA. Um, but um, we're, with the net, with the internet and the uh, ability, the uh, uh, you can really, uh, in, in, uh, the resources on the internet are staggering. Um, like I said, I we needed to move over to the power. Uh, Microsoft Learn has a um, has their own certifications and platforms as well, um, but I don't like it because I think it reads like a commercial for Microsoft and doesn't have enough practical exercises. Uh, but I bought myself a book called um, Microsoft Power BI Step by Step, and um, and uh, uh, what did that cost me thirty um, dollars? boo-hoo, um, but the corporations will, yeah, they'll provide free online classes. Uh, in fact, they'll probably require you to take a certain number of free online classes every year, you know, if you take, you know, two classes in communication skills. Every year I have to take a class in cybersecurity and a class in um, sexual harassment and harassment in general. And, that's um, not upward mobility. That's not upward mo work related. We look at the uh, university. My employers have a, the University of Illinois graduate school. Tuition reimbursement for MBAs. Okay. Yeah, I mean, wasn't that to what route to go? You didn't mention that. If you want to move ahead, don't you have to acquire 
I mean, it's a changing, updating world. Certainly, the tech world is one that's under constant flux. Wouldn't one be, as I would think you would have to. get a degree in the technology stuff because it changes so much and changes so rapidly that, um, you know, even, you know, and, and I have gotten some certifications, but, and I will be getting some certifications um, uh, I have, you know, but but uh, but but it changes rapidly and okay. yeah. Let's move on to the next question. Go ahead, and then we'll get the next one in the back. Loud, if you don't mind, please. We have a very high volume um, of businesses and, and we have a lot of entrepreneurship to the detriment too. This 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 love, the the beautiful, the, the myth of the Silicon Valley the myth that has become of the Silicon Valley entrepreneur uh, has led to things like Adam Newman's WeWork now is bankrupt, but he walks away with $1.7 billion or whatever. And, um, you know, the Serranos and whatever, but what it is, we have a lot of failure. We have so much failure, but then among all this massive high volume of failure, there's a couple acorns that turn into mighty oaks. Um, let's see, Steve Jobs was a college dropout, so was Bill Gates, uh, and, um, you know, so you have people, Paul Ophelia, a lot of them are dyslexic, so who are these people who are the creators? Uh, they have some tendencies, they tend to be dyslexic, hyperactive, uh, they tend to be college dropouts, uh, they tend to be people who innovated at a very young um, age, they could have been really crappy kids in school because they were bored and they couldn't sit there and they were really bored. Um, it's interesting to study these people who um, are able to create brilliant um, things. Uh, um, I had had the, the uh, people who are innovators or innovators at a young age. Again, there is a tendency they have some markers some of them are dyslexic and hyperactive um and they're people who think outside the box um All right, let's repeat, uh, yeah, repeat the question, uh, Karina. The the um the, the Dell Michael Dell um he came from a the one thing that is true this is the truth is the vast majority of entrepreneurs are not rags to riches. For example, Bill Gates, um, his father was a president of a bank, and Michael Dell, his mother was a periodontist. No, his mother was a stockbroker. His father was a periodontist. Uh, a lot of these people come from. Um, from from wealthy backgrounds, um, but um, their their children. Um, Richard Branson, um, he was a kid. He went into multiple businesses as a child, and he at one point it was kind of funny in his autobiography because he thought he can go into business rating seeing birds, and then he was um, it went way out of hand. But in America, we have a lot of new small businesses fail, and we have a lot of businesses, and a lot of them fail, but then. Like I said, you have those ones that go through and manage um, to go through. Uh, in addition to, I guess the other thing I, in addition to people who have dyslexia and are hyperactive, you also may have the autistic uh, people. If you think that uh, the founder of Facebook, Mark Kravenberg, 
may be autistic or um, some people describe Steve Jobs or, um, or um, Bill Gates as autistic, um, uh, uh, Asperger's not, um, but, but they see things differently. They, they approach things differently. Paulo Falea, he founded, um, he founded, it's now part of FedEx, but he founded Kinko. And he was a hyperactive, dyslexic person with uh, anger management issues and a practical joker. That's another trait. That we have these people who are practical jokers. Now, uh. I don't know what happens in Europe or Asia to these type of people who are bad student, you know, practical jokers. Um, I can't, you know, and, and um, I know the founder of Southwest was another one who has dyslexia and attention deficit disorder, and he founded Southwest. And uh, so, so the, a lot of the creativity are coming from people who are neurodivergent. And here we got one more. A lot of the presidents are left-handed people. Yeah, one back here. Go ahead, uh, hang on. Yeah, yeah, Karina, you were so clever to include those biblical quotations. Uh, I just wonder what you think uh, if Jesus was hiring and he was uh, part of corporate uh, uh, ancient uh, Palestine there, uh, uh, he would hire uh, Matthew, the tax collector, or Judas uh, for his uh, initiative. Um, well, Jesus I... wants people to listen to him. So it, which one was a better listener? That was he wanted people to listen to him and believe in him. And that was the crux of what he wanted. So whichever one was the better listener because Mary Magdalene was a whore so yeah I mean it doesn't God doesn't God know the people's hearts so he's got an advantage doesn't he I guess that's Calvinism yeah um but but who who will listen to me you know that's his main who will listen and hear my word and spread it and spread it okay we got one okay go ahead so I think another area we need to focus on is more of the advanced skills the machine of you know, your advanced trades, uh, your more advanced tradesmen. Well, um, actually, this is kind of a, a queer subject. You know, if we do, if if we do go I'll go on to electric cars, that's actually less skilled. Um, you know, part of uh, it takes more parts and more labor to build a mechanical a car with an engine, a combustible engine versus a car that is an electric device, you know, you have electrolysis, you plug them in right to a wall. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, the um, I, I am in favor of apprenticeships and good apprenticeships and good quality apprenticeships. And that's what I think software engineering should be um, is apprenticeships. Um, okay. So the but, uh, industry really should have apprenticeships. It's kind of up to the industry also to the problem is industries don't want to invest in the education that would really benefit them anyway. Um, so if there really is a need for higher mechanics and Ford, um, Ford, uh, Chrysler and General Motors should create a common curriculum and teach the mechanics and um, um, common practice in Germany. They, they should all get together and create the curriculum. And, and teach the mechanics, but I'm in favor of apprenticeships and um, okay. and learning at work. You don't learn that in a classroom by listening to um, a lecture, but you also have to reward people. So there was a lecture I went and we all need car mechanics. And then, um, and these were wealthy people listening to the lecture. And then it came out that people who do become automotive mechanics are not at $15 an hour and there's a shortage. Why is there a shortage? Why aren't they paid more if there's a shortage of auto mechanics? And, you know, so, um, yeah, not all of us need to get a high school. I mean, so there, there are high schools that are vocational high schools, and I hope they're good, but okay. I didn't go to one. So. Are you amenable to more questions, or do you want to go to rebuttals now, Karina? Does I got one, Tim. I got one, Timmy. All right, that's fine. Go ahead, Charlie. Well, all right, according to the Libertarian Party, they advance uh, and support free market capitalism. But under free market capitalism, it's totally appropriate, isn't it, 
for the owner of the CEO to hire his son and make him a vice president. So, do you think that's... You know, Ford hired his sons, and then he also sabotaged his sons, particularly Edsel, who died... Well, that's okay. You do you think that's okay? Libertarians are okay in, in advancing. Failure, and this is a major failure, and that's with corporate government. So you should have a separate CEO who's separate from chairman of the board, and there should be a check and balance. Uh, the problem is there's too much, what did I say about Slack or Chad, chumminess, and that's why you have this obscene executive pay, uh, and that's why the executive pay isn't put into check, and, and you have this, it's not nice to be mean to your friend um, the CEO when you're on the board of directors and the CEO was really a nice guy. Um, and so that's why you have this obscene executive compensation. Um, what the Libertarian Party does say is that companies can fail. That means that Intel should not have gotten government grants, nor should have the automotive makers, nor should the airlines. Um, if they had failed during the COVID lockdown, uh, we could have had younger businesses started by younger CEOs that were more innovative and better done um, instead of us um, bailing them out. But so if the owner wants to hire a son, that's family. perfectly now, okay. The company and the CEO hires his son who's incompetent to be a CEO, then that will fail or, or the board of directors or the... It's not allowed. Yes. But um, actually, there there isn't a lot of, I, I mean, yeah, so there should be check and balance. And the problem is that we have a very weak system for putting CEOs in check or holding CEOs accountable. Because if they fail, they end up with a golden parachute. So, well, checks and balances, do you mean regulation? Regulation of companies. CEOs accountable very, very, very rarely. The one time they did is, um, Ken Lewis, who was the CEO of Bank of America and a merge with Morgan Stanley um, in a real stupid merger. And he actually did, he was voted out, but there needs to be more of that and there isn't. And so you have people like Carl Icahn who do try to hold, um, you know, corporate um, raiders to try to hold the CEOs accountable. But um, yeah, so. Okay, Jonathan, this will be our last question. You talked about results, relationships, and reputation. In the event that sometime soon in our lifetimes the dollar collapses, is it conceivable that those three points might quickly change from results, relationships, and reputation to general strike, general strike, general strike? If the dollar collapses, uh, well, one of the questions is what would take place of the dollar? Uh, and so that would also affect what the outcome would be. Would it be the Chinese uh, yuan or uh, the Japanese yen or, um, or would it be uh, gold currency? And that would determine what the outcome would be. That, so the dollar would be replaced with what? Would it be the euro? You know, it, 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 and that would have an effect on, yeah. Okay. All right, I want to allow some time for some rebuttals tonight because I'm sure a lot of people got going. I'm going to give everybody about four minutes. Justin, you're chomping at the bit, so you'll get the first rebuttal. Oh, all right. Good job, Karina. Good job, Karina. Let's yes, thank good job. Uh, it, was right. a good, it was a good, interesting topic. Uh, thank you for uh, speaking. I was, you know, lots of stuff uh, I haven't thought about. Um, who here lives in Cook County and is a registered voter? All right. Does anybody here live in Danny Davis's congressional district, District 7? All right. And does anybody live in the 36th ward? Uh, it's like Ukrainian village up and then kind of straddles I think Grand Avenue up to like Fullerton and like the Brickyard. Okay, well, everybody who raised their hand for Cook County, I'm gonna give you a petition to sign. Uh, and it's a Libertarian Party uh, petition. I know Charlie 
just really excited about that one. So we're going to pass it around and please sign it. Uh, thank you. Is that the rebuttal? Is that yes. It? Good rebuttal. Let a rebuttal. Frame. Meaning, let the people freely think. Let the people freely listen. Let the people freely voice, freely exchange ideas, freely debate, freely learn, freely associate, freely canvas and conduct outreach. Let the people freely assemble. Let the people freely discuss and question. Let the people freely organize. Let the people freely campaign. Let the people freely write, freely publish, freely broadcast, freely podcast, freely email. Let the people freely text and freely tweet and freely unite. Let the people freely vote. Let the people freely elect those who are defenders and nurturers of our values. Let the people unionize, let freedom be free. Uh, one book, I don't know if this is available online, but you might want to order it. It's called the Boston Review. I think it's from like six years ago. It talks about work inequality and basic income. Uh, Brishan Rogers, Philip Van Paris, Dorian Warren, Tommy Shelby, and Diane Coyle. And they talk about uh, during the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam War uh, movement, we forget <laughs> that one of the hot topics in the end of the 60s that the media doesn't like to discuss is radical economic justice for all. They talked about uh, universal basic income. Uh, people were starting to realize if we can have multiple wars on earth, we obviously are a very wealthy country. We can have an income for every uh, adult in this country who wants to either work full-time or work part-time or to give their volunteering services. They could have like a room and board situation where that would be a society that was based on human needs and not greed. Here's a quote by King that reminds me of what they were getting at the crux of cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? Expediency asks the question, is it politics? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And uh, from the very beginning of this talk tonight, stop working so hard. You're going to get us all fired. You see what the system of oligarchy and plutocracy and hegemony and imperialism does. It pits us all against each other. And we love each other. We really like each other. Look how many people. Come from different parts of the country, have different perspectives, different experiences. And refuse to be pitted against each other because we know that's the old game. They always pit one half of the working class, middle class, against the other half of the working class, middle class. And I am so proud in this uh, year 2023 to be in a city where an underdog candidate won for mayorship and beat the, uh, the favorite who was the, system's, uh, the, who was the system's choice. And hopefully that's just the tip of the iceberg that we, we can do in regards to economics, not just electoral. Uh, voices and ideas being voiced. Don't be pitted against each other. Our common interests far outweigh our differences. Thank you to Karina to one of the best talks we've ever had. Yeah. Okay, yes. Oh. All right, Mike Lehman, you're next. Okay, the topic here tonight was don't work too hard and um, <laughs> what was the last part of it? Where's he going? Something about corporations. So anyway, we got to bring back the five-inch heels. That's, that's one point we made tonight. 
<laughs> no, I really appreciate it. I know, but it. Why do you think they call it harass anyway? You know, it's such a good thought. Anyway, I couldn't let go of that. So anyway, um, besides that, you know, one thing I've learned in corporations. Now, thank goodness I have my own uh, consultancy. So, like my customers are my boss, so I don't have to deal with moron bosses. Well, one thing I've learned about moron bosses and management <laughs> is you want to live near your office <laughs> because the more often you see your bosses, the more often you get tips on how to, how to, when they're getting fired or when they're quitting or when you can get ahead and then they you get tired of looking at you so they'll kick you upstairs. And uh, unfortunately, for a long time, I lived like 40 miles away from my office. Or farther. I mean, I had an office up in Minneapolis, and I was working remotely back when remotely wasn't cool in the '90s. And I was like 400 miles away from my headquarters, and you know, just a phone call or a fax is my only communication. That was before the internet. And um, you know, I've always had offices far away. So I think when you show up at the office, they get to know you. You get to know them and, uh, you know, um, keep an eye on things. Yeah. Because, you know, stuff goes down. And if you're not around, then you get, you know, the short end of the stick, right? Tim? <laughs> you know what I'm talking well, about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I've been in the office for most of my life. So you're president now. Or you're on your way up. No. Just trust it, but don't get paid enough. Well, wait for your manager to die or, you know, go to Florida or something. What if I find out you're an income poop? No. What? They found out. What if I find out you don't know what you're doing? Well, that's, you got to keep that a secret. <laughs> All right. Good night, you, Chicago. You're yeah. worthless. All right. Who's next? And, and sh show up at the office. <laughs> Don't let anybody. All right, who's next? We got. We still got openings for remote people too. All right, Doug Binkley. Don't trust anybody. That's right. Yeah, I. I wasn't sure I was going to come tonight, but then I realized that um, since I'm retired, um, there's not going to be anything useful I can learn, so I just came. Uh, but. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I was uh, an employee, and uh, of course, um, um, my I, I I I wrote and I, you know, thought of a lot of things, and um, I've been a protester and uh, some um, worked for a not for profit uh, when I was working nights. I went into the Chicago schools and tried to teach Shakespeare and science to kids, but um, that was on the side. Um, but uh, when I was an employee for a large corporation, uh, I got lucky by being one of those that Karina um, was saying. She thought it was uh, better be noticed, but I just tried not to be noticed. I was one of those that had various at those times different skills that yeah they did need me, and um, you know I well I could have asked for more money because I was indispensable or whatever, but um, it just. Um, never really occurred to me to uh, try to do that. So, gee, if I could have learned from Karina, just think I'm, how much more money I could have made and then lost it in the market like she's talking about. So, <laughs> the um, interesting thing, she didn't mention the Peter Principle. That was maybe, uh, that was a, another book that came out uh, maybe a while, good while ago, might have even been before your time. Um, but uh, it was about um, uh, a guy who, um, Again, made a satirical bunch of comments about the corporate world and uh, about uh, uh, people in the organizations um, uh, aspire, you know, they aspire higher to what they're good at and they end up at their level of mediocrity or whatever he called it. Uh, that their farthest advancement would be there because once they got out of their level of, uh, of uh, where they were suited, when their ability was exactly right to their position, and they got into a higher position. Well, they wouldn't be demoted because that was the corporation would be admitting a main mistake, but yet they couldn't advance them further. So they were in a position of mediocrity. They stayed there forever. That was the Peter principle, if I'm remembering it correctly. 
And uh, it seems to be somewhat similar. Uh, Karina was making also different cynical observations and, and uh, probably quite accurate in many cases uh, about how the stagnation and the lack of creativity does it stagnate our, uh, our companies here. Although, as she pointed out in answering one of the questions that um, uh, even uh, though Finland and other countries are more educated, um, have more educated uh, people uh, employed, uh, they still don't uh, seem to um, uh, go at the same level of uh, entrepreneurship or create or um, going out and forming newer corporations or whatever. Um, so I'm um, I'm impressed by uh, her observations. Some of it was rather comical, uh, but uh, um, much of it was true. And uh, uh, again, yeah, since I'm retired, I can't take advantage of it very much. But um, except maybe I can write something satirical, a play or something. Thank you, Karina. How about a talk, Doug? All right, Ernie, you're next. Yeah, Ernie. Right. Doug, I. Yeah, you're Doug, right. I don't know if you remember Tom Barry, but Tom Barry's favorite saying when he retired, he says, the worst thing about being retired is you never get a day off. So, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what's that? Yeah, I, Karina, I apologize for getting here late. There's, there's a long story on that, but not a very interesting one. And uh, so I'm mostly going to comment here on some of the questions and, and comments. Uh, about extreme executive pay, I, I agree, it's insane. Um, it's almost as insane, insane as what athletes get. You know, that's pretty insane too, although the owners are even getting richer. Uh, that could be solved through a tax system, which actually was a little more prog progressive and designed to getting the money uh, where it'll do the most good. Um, the issue of creativity and why we have all this creativity and this inventiveness here in this country, and they don't have it in other countries. Kevin asked, was asking that question. And I think there's a few reasons. I think the main reason that we, our economy is so advanced and so creative is because of our uh, immigrants. Uh, a lot of us here are immigrants or were the children of immigrants or maybe grandchildren of immigrants were typically fairly close to the people who came over here. And we have to look at the reasons they came over here and who they were um, and who they were and, and what the, their lives were like uh, over there. And the, they, they were very comfortable, not necessarily doing wonderfully, but they were very comfortable and secure. Uh, life was more or less predetermined over there. If you were uh, a wealthy, from a wealthy family, um, you were going to be wealthy. If you were from a merchant's family, uh, you were going to be a merchant. If you were a farmer's family, you were going to be a farmer. And that was fine. Your life was predetermined and within those limits, it was secure. Uh, over here, all that went away. Now, the big, the big issue in creativity is the willingness to take risks. Of course, you have to have intelligence and be creative but you have to also be willing to take risks. You have to risk money, sometimes your health, your, your family relationships, your reputation, et cetera. And the people who were willing to take that risk of leaving over there and coming over here to an unknown situation obviously are risk takers. That's the first and most important quality for, uh, for uh, being successful and creating successful institutions. Um, and also we have over here a, a political system that, uh, that uh, well, we have an economic system that encourages risk and a political system that doesn't get in the way too much. And so I think those are the reasons, uh, those are the reasons that uh, we have a lot more creativity in terms of everything from new restaurants and new menus to new uh, uh, airliners and, and uh, rocket ships and electronics, et cetera. A lot of it, as Kevin pointed out, is invented here, even though it may be manufactured somewhere else. The, a lot of the ideas come from here. Now, not all of them. Uh, you know, somebody mentioned France and Japan and some other countries as not being creative. They are, okay. They have a, a lot of things come from Finland. 
Uh, Nokia was from Finland and some other companies. So they do, they are creative, but they're not as creative as we are. And disposable income. Businesses and individuals here have lots of disposable income that they can throw at new products and services uh, to, to uh, help them get off the ground if they have some merit. And if they don't, then the people drop off and do something else for a while and maybe, maybe try again. Um, the one thing where maybe I disagree, but there we go, uh, with Karina is on whistleblowers. If something is being, is, is, you know, being done that shouldn't be done, somebody should talk about it. Somebody should be willing to do that. And anonymously, if possible, but if not, you know, otherwise, perhaps people are going to be hurt in one way or another. Uh, if it maybe helps, maybe other things, uh, and maybe just economically, if we don't uh, call down people who are doing things that are inappropriate. And that's about all I have for now. Thank you. All right. Uh, anybody online or next up here for rebuttals? Okay. Yeah, I'll go, Timmy. Go ahead, Charlie. All right. First of all, I'd like to thank Karina for putting together a nice presentation or an overview of the system of employment in, in our nation. I will talk about four areas here. Uh, for specifically. Now, within the civil service, the government of the United States, an ongoing record is maintained of an employee's performance. Every employee sits down with their manager, their supervisor, and they get a semi-annual and an annual review. And you'll get a score from one to five and a narrative of what work you performed. Uh, and training and so forth. So when it comes time to award promotions, you can sit down and all the applicants and there's an extensive record that you can review of the qualifications of each applicant. So it depends on the record. This is a, a good system. One, the more records, the better um, that are maintained is likely, it's called merit staffing. It's a very difficult area to administer. Okay, number two, I've handled well over 100 formal grievances that were filed by people who were passed over by promotions. Only on occasion were these really easy, easily achievable in the sense that uh, an unqualified person was promoted. Um, usually the settlement was was that two promotions, oddly enough, were awarded. And that would be the settlement that we normally got out of it. It's not an easy case to establish because most of the candidates for positions are essentially and basically qualified. They're all qualified for the most part. Uh, of course, you do have people apply who don't. And those are easily sifted out but you're still left with a number of applicants who all have the basic qualifications for the position. And if that's the case, the selecting official can choose whomever he or she chooses among qualified candidates. Now, the third thing is, if you want to have real upward mobility, um, it's even been discovered, you have to have continuing and ongoing education. I never was out of school, even though I engaged in labor issues for 35 years, I was never technically ever out of school for any extended period of time. If any course that I could take, I tried to take advantage of whether it was the Department of Labor offered by my union, uh, the AFL-CIO, and even though I was a member of the United, State, United Association of Labor Educators, I still would take any courses that I thought that would improve my skills or abilities. It's a very quickly changing world. 
and he got to be at top of the game. And that's what I mean. When I'm still at the top of the game, but that's where you want to be if you want to get at. Uh, and the last thing is, I heard tonight about. I often hear this, especially from the Libertarian Party and guys like Timmy, that capitalism works. It does. Meaning it functions properly. But I heard tonight that it does not function properly. As a matter of fact, what I heard tonight is that it's one incoherent mess. And I also heard that for some reason it's totally appropriate for a CEO to give it a, a high level position and high salary to his son or daughter who may or may not have even one qualification for the position. Now, why you would support a system like this eludes me. That's completely... <laughs> and you come up here and you complain about promotions. And yet, there's an inerrant feature that the right to hire is maintained under free market capital. The right to hire is also the right to promote because you're actually hiring somebody for a position. So why, if you want to support free market capitalism, this is what you're going to end up with. And you get what... <laughs> I, it's, some, it's not no surprise to me to find out that, oh my... It's not fair. It doesn't work. I told you over again, capitalism doesn't work. I guess it works if you're unqualified, a nincompoop, you get a high high salary job. If you are qualified and you work real hard, it doesn't work. Well, what kind of system is this? I'm saying, anyhow, thank you very much. I always enjoy your talks, and please come again sometime. Thank you. All right, this reserve, this is... Uh... Charlie, the point of the matter is capitalism works. The thing is, Charlie, don't you think that the uh, human proclivities of uh, favoritism, the human proclivities of uh, the dynastic succession appear in capitalism? Yes, they do. But there is a check. If the guy's an income poop and the company doesn't work, it goes bankrupt. The thing is, is that uh, when you have a communist government, you can have some income poops in, but they have the guns. And they don't leave office that quickly. And they don't have an accountability of a customer. And they don't have an accountability thing. The problem is with your socialist... They're chosen by the, by the commune. They're chosen by the commune. The people choose it. Not some guy. Ran by the commune? I've never seen a commune ran right, Charlie. Somebody's always in charge. <laughs> Every union has an election. They all have elections. Yeah, your 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 idea of capitalism would be great if it wasn't for the corporate socialism that ends up uh, bailing all these banks and companies out. Where are these great, these great capitalist com uh, companies that you say stand and fall on their own mm. on their own merits are the very first to go cap in hand to the taxpayer every time they make a mistake. Whether it be a bank or a, or, or, or a car manufacturer or whatever, they're always up every time they go belly up and they pay all their corporate uh, bosses mega, mega, mega bucks. And then suddenly the, the company goes belly up. It's us, the taxpayer, that has to fork out their money to bail them out. Yeah. Who wants, who wants a system run by unqualified people? Communists. Can't hear you, Tim. Hi, Alexa. Hi, Charlie. Nice to hear your voice again. Tim, you're silenced. <laughs>
Anyway, anyway, I'm not, you, I'm not, it doesn't pay to work too hard. Calvin, he's got you silenced too. I don't know why. Who's doing this? So anyway, this yeah, guy's like your little guy goes for a job in a fact in a foundry, you know, when they make steel and brass and stuff. Just there's there's your broom. He says he's sweeping up. He says there's your broom and there's your goggles. He says what's the goggles for? He says the sparks. He says you're not going to get any sparks off this broom, pal. Tim, you're silenced. You have to unmute yourself. He doesn't know how to run this thing. Oh well. He he screwed up. He <laughs> silenced himself. Must well have an atom while we're waiting here, Charlie. What's that? Must well have an atom while we're waiting. Bit of result for the Democrats here. The I told them it wasn't for career advancement. It was for a much better reason. I wanted to learn how to repair my own computers and get them working properly. That to me was a much better reason to take that class than to get ahead in a job. Now, I'm not saying that Masters is there, but I also know too that it's also bettered me in my own life, especially working with this organization here, the College of Complexes. It's been an education, but I've learned a lot through Toastmasters and through this place here. Anyway, I've gotten off my soapbox. Next, next rebutter, please. Is there a place called Croissant Masters? I don't know. All right, Alexa, you want you got your hand up? Go ahead. Oh, right. okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, why don't you show yourself if you can? Yeah, sure. Here, if hold you, on. Just um. We, we don't like it, but it's always good. It's always nice. Thanks. Hi, All right. Go Hello. Ahead. Hi. 
it's been a while since I've been here. Honestly, I haven't been here for a while because, uh, well, quite frankly, um, enduring some people here, uh, specifically Charlie and their misogyny has been kind of frustrating. So I took a break and now I'm back, but now I'm a little like, you know, wondering why the heck I came back because Charlie is being his pleasant self as always. You know, he told me that I didn't know how to do my job, that I didn't know even know what a pension was. I'm a woman in tech. I have my master's from Johns Hopkins in applied economics, but sure, some old white guy can tell me that, you know, that I must not know what I'm doing and criticize me and all that stuff. And, you know, not have any real reason for it. And then just, you know, bitch about the Libertarian Party despite any actual you know, ev- counter evidence I present to him, but that's fine. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I don't think anybody was saying here that capitalism is without flaws. It is, however, without, you know, mass genocide, which, uh, more than you can say for, you know, Russia or anything, and actually that's, as for why a lot of innovation does come from the United States, um, you know, well, actually, there's this film called Tetris, um, out, and I think that answers that question perfectly, because the dude in Russia who invented Tetris, which I know what you're thinking, is like, why is this game about blocks, like, this massive economic success and phenomenon, but it is, because people like playing it, um, but, you know, in Soviet Russia, Soviet Russia owns your creation, and therefore you can't trademark it or anything. And the film's about how this, like, you know, American-Russian team up and, you know, get it patented and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, there's no motivation in, like, your hardcore, you know, communist countries to actually allow people to innovate because the government will take ownership of it. And then if you protest, then, you know, you die. Like I said, you know, say what you want about capitalism and, you know, that people are allowed to make crappy choices. But, you know, usually people aren't allowed to kill each other. Actually, I that's pretty much not allowed. And, I mean, I know antitrust laws at least can, you know, cover that. The other thing I think is just that with, like, yes, corporations suck. Um, but I mean, corporations are like, you know, less than 1% executive leadership and, you know, 99% you're more hardworking people, you know, trying to get through the day. And those hardworking people, they like to, they have each other's backs and stuff. And I mean, yeah, like, okay, so I work for a corporation, you know, higher leadership is fake as hell they at least once a quarter they like make us all sit on a phone call in which they just incessantly praise one another it's really uncomfortable oh and then like they always talk about like how much they need diversity and stuff despite the fact that like everyone on the call is white i i wanted to make a drinking game out of it um if you know drinking at work were appropriate but instead, I just, you know, make fun of them with my co- co-workers. Um, but yes, these, you know, within departments and stuff, there's plenty of room for advancement. If you want to be CEO, yeah, that's going to require some, you know, there's a lot of stupid stupidity and bias in that. Um, but generally speaking, yes, you work hard, you do get promoted. Not only that, but just within, like, your team, you know, you work hard, you, you know, you help, you help take some, take on someone's work when they're gone, you know, when they're out sick or whatever, or on vacation, and then they're willing to help you when, you know, you're sick or on vacation. And just generally, you get a reputation as being somebody, you know, who is it, who you like, people like working with, um, and stuff like that, and just, you're just, a reputation as somebody who is, you know, gets things done and things. So, yes, while there's a lot of corporate BS people have to tolerate and stuff and things on the really high level, 
I, I do think, generally speaking, if you work for, like me, in a small department within a massive corporation, there's plenty of room for career advance advancement and for, you know, general bonding and stuff like that. Also, like I said, haven't had any man, you know, despite being a woman in tech, I've not had any man, you know, question my ability um, within my workplace. I've gotten far more of it from Charlie here, who, well, quite frankly, doesn't know shit about me. But, except that I'm a libertarian. He doesn't like those, because, you know, <laughs> capitalism. Well, I don't think people should compete with their co-workers. We should work yeah. together. for a common goal. We do work we're together. Work. That's just what I said, exactly. Work, work, everyone works together for a common goal and purpose. Not competing against one another for more money. All at a time, Charlie. Charlie, one for one time, please. Uh, <laughs> I didn't hear it. But... See, the general idea, see, I, I think you kind of see, so there's like, there's competition in like the sense of, you know, we want to provide a good product and make sure that good product, you know, exists because the consumer deserves the best. Versus, like, you know, this general kind of attitude of businesses competing versus, like, you know, the toxic attitude of, I'm going to go, you know, throat to throat with my coworker. No, actually, because, yeah. like, if my department does well, me and all of my coworkers benefit. And stuff Smith like that. I mean, you awesome. seem to just... Time, Charlie, please. Charlie, please stop interrupting me. It's very sexist. Okay, okay, okay. Like I said, it's interesting to me that, you know, some pinko Marxist, you know, who loves Stalin and claims all this, you know, you know, your progressive stuff is just so, so insulting to a person like me who is a woman but doesn't happen to, you know, subscribe to all of the ideological BS that you do. Um, no personal. Like I said, it, it seems actually that you don't actually care about women advancing. You just care about women, you know, who obey you advancing. How do you know what I care about women? Yes. I'm sorry. So you do hate women? Okay, okay, okay. Let's. Uh, How do you know? Let it across talk now. Crazy. Well, like I said, okay, fine. Sorry. Like I said, I'm just saying, I've faced far more misogyny. At the College of Complexes than I have at my career, which I've spent far more time at. Okay, Alexa, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Alexa. And we really appreciate you coming. All right, who's next? All right, you want to go next? Okay, go, go. Kevin, do you want to go? Okay, Kelvin, do you want to make any statements? Yeah, I just said yeah. I wanted to. Uh, um, I do appreciate what a lot what Alexa said, and, uh, and it's great to see it. Um, I do uh, take the point of order on the the fact that capitalism isn't being responsible for any genocide. Um, it's responsible for genocide when there's money in it. Um, you know, if you if you ask any Irishman, they will say that the English were responsible for genocide in the Irish uh, potato famine. You ask any Iraqi, uh, they'll tell you that uh, America and Britain were responsible for genocide to grab their oil. Um, you know, yes, capitalism is responsible for genocide, just generally not in their own countries, because they've got, you know, that, 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 can, uh, that can lead them to lose some power. Okay, sorry, counterpoint, but starving to death as a result of natural causes is not the same as you know, somebody murdered. It is, it is when you take all the food away. Again, still a difference between directly murdering uh, someone and, 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 don't and, like and, their and the, uh, and the genocide in Iraq wasn't due to starvation. It was due to, it was due to the, the to the bombing and the, and the destabilization of the country and all the destabilization destabilizations of all the countries in South America that people like Dole bananas uh, of of uh, of uh, and, and Exxon, I know, you know, the, the, the genocide, uh, 
Yes, so they're all yeah, socialist there is, countries. The capitalist, look, the difference between the difference between a capital of Victorian market forces and a drug dealer <laughs> is a drug dealer's got more morals than market forces. If there's if there's more profit to be made in selling your grandmother, then market forces will sell a grandmother. Well, see, I'd rather I don't know, some market forces do some vague crap than just, you know some government official come in and murder me because I don't subscribe to their views and I refuse to just, you know, you know, comply with their BS. Oh, I'm not, listen, I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm, not, say, I'm not, I'm not saying there's a better, I'm not, I'm not saying there's a better, capitalism is by its own nature um, doomed because okay. you, can, you can, every, every, every nation works on uh, the, um, the, the, the principle of growth. And we have a limited planet with limited resources. You cannot have unlimited growth with limited resources. Okay, where is genocide occurring in the United States right now? Actual genocide, people being murdered. Um, it's not not in the, I say not, not in the United States. Okay, I, now what about China? Where is genocide going on in China? I want some Calvin. I'm we're I'm gonna move on to the next time, please. All right. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the time. uh back and forth, but we gotta move on. Okay, who else has got a rebuttal? I got one more. I would like to know go. why we should compete with one another in order to make the CEOs rich. That's exactly what they want. We're fighting each other in order to make them rich. You gotta be nuts to do that. It's called making money, Charlie. And that's the goal of any corporation is to make, to make the CEO rich. Really? Does everybody, I mean, do people in, uh, does, and, does no one but the CEO make a salary in a corporation? No. All right, guys. I'll tell you, I'm going to close out with this quote and bring, or bring Karina back up here to do the last word. The thing is, Victor Sarnoff, head of RCA, said this. Competition brings out the best in products, but the worst in people. And he uh, invented color television. He also invented the FM radio, which by far are very superior products. Okay, we're going to give Karina the last word. Uh, Karina, you got the last word. No, All right, Karina. All right, ahead. there's there's a public union and there's two people who both qualify for the same position for the public union um, standards for this the, the standards in the public union. And so there's two or three employees who could potentially get this um, promotion, but there's only one spot available. Um, the person who gets it is the one who is the most liked, the one who is the most um, the one who is the hardest to reject, the one who you it would be hardest to, to say no to, uh, and, and that's the one who's going to get that promotion. Uh, you should be continually learning, but expecting that always to be in a academic classroom is, is where I disagree with you. It isn't, hey, let's stop learning. Um, I have to, I'm currently in a massive learning phase now in my job, but do I have to get it from a classroom? No. Um, in that every day I'm, I'll be on tools like Stack Overflow um, or other um, uh, user groups or, or bulletin boards. Um, so I, I learn all the time. I just don't necessarily learn it in a classroom with a teacher in a, at an accredited college. Um, there was a woman who spoke and she was a woman in tech. How long has she had her position? How, how long has she been at her company? How long has she had her position? And has she ever had any promotions? Um, I also warn her that sometimes you're in relationships and the relationships, and then you look back and that's when you start to realize that you've been dissed or, or that you've been, um, yeah, the, the point is, is is there's, let's say, three employees on a team. There's only one slot open for managers. So we have to decide which of these employees is going to become the manager. And, and politics plays a big role in that. Now, I'm not the one who makes that decision. But um, being liked, being visible, you could have worked your behind off on a low visibility but crucial um, 
uh, job and, um, and, and, and then be passed over for a promotion. Um, and um, creativity in the United States. I, I uh, yeah, I think that Ernie made some good points about immigration. Definitely, we've had immigrants do some, uh, you know, be the founders of uh, and, and play pivotal roles. Um, and and um, yeah, um, it's just always keep in mind that for every Microsoft, there's you know hundreds of other failures. Um, and um, uh, for one, there was a recent movie out called about research in motion, which uh, created the BlackBerry. And you know they really were the innovators, but not the ultimate successors, because then um, Apple came through and and really. Apple's always known for design and, and did it the Apple way. Um, if you have a job, learn the politics. You have to play the politics. Yes. Learn the escape and the network of it. Uh, don't stay in your job too long. Um, if you want a promotion, let your boss know that you want a promotion or that you're expecting a promotion. And um, yeah, uh, my my prediction is that there will be a change in corporate culture if we do have more Asians as top CEOs. Uh, I think that will lead to uh, uh, a change in corporate culture and maybe bring us more towards a meritocracy. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you. All right. Want to close us out, Mike? Close us out. And adjourn us. That concludes, huh? okay. that concludes the uh, college of complexes for November 11th. Have a happy Veterans Day or respectful. So let's keep America out of wars. Solemn. Anything else? Anybody else want to make a rebuttal? Yeah, next week. <laughs> Next week we're going to Eastern Europe. Next week we're going to Eastern Europe, Lithuania. Right adjacent right. to the Soviet Union. I'm going to go sing some karaoke at Cafe Mustache. Who's joining me? Cafe Mustache? Charlie going to come out and sing songs at Cafe Mustache. Sing songs? I, I don't know what that is. Karaoke at Cafe Mustache? All right. Okay, the meetings are